just going to talk about, make a little disclaimer on some foundation training because honestly a lot of times when I start teaching somebody foundation training, they get worse and they're harder to adjust. And that's not the goal at all. The idea is to strengthen the spine so it's easier to adjust you and so those bones stay in place longer. So one thing we're trying to avoid, and this all goes back to the hip hinging steps we're going over, so you can try those first two steps we're going over with the stuff we're about to do. So we don't want this extension happening. So a lot of people, we lock in our old ideas of what posture should be, and then disengages our ability to hinge at the hips. We want all four dots lined up when we're activating all these steps. And we're still going, there's gonna be 10 steps, so be patient with that. And it's not just doing foundation training, it's daily life. You can add these steps to your workouts, you can, how you're sitting, how you're standing, how you're walking. So it's not like you're wasting time doing these steps, you're just adding one step at a time. You spend a whole week on each step, that's really gonna help. So the first step was the feet, second step was loading the hamstrings, and you can see all these steps in combinations with the workout we're doing, it's actually for the shoulders today, but it's still for the spine to strengthen that. So take your time with the steps. Get this right so you're not compressing your spine. As you can see in these pictures, with the head shifted back, that jams the spine down. So both these guys have a similar problem, whereas these erector spinae muscles, which are here, are pulling down. Tight, overdeveloped erector spinal muscles can pull our spines too far into extension, forcing our hips forward and disengaging the hip hinge. When getting into the right stance, you will learn to feel tension being built up in these erector spinal muscles. We're not only stretching, but we're engaging the hip flexor and the deeper spinal muscles. You can see the deep erectors here being stretched as we engage the hip flexors even more, forcing the hips into the socket, creating tension in our spines, making them stronger. Jamming all those spinal joints in together and it pushes the hips forward. So you'll notice all these hip hinging exercises are getting the hips underneath you, lining this dot up with the heel, just like over here. And the other problem is when we get the head back, we can engage those abdominals and shorten them as we should. And that allowed that to, makes it harder for us to engage the hip, get it in the socket as we should. So we kind of have to erase some of our ideas of what good posture is. Just relax your shoulders, relax your, relax your neck when you're starting these things. Start from the feet, start from the hip, and then add the neck lat. Hey guys, just wanted to give a little intro to mastering the art of the hip hinge. So why 10 steps? Why are we complicating posture this much? Uh, it's my belief that I'm, I'm teaching you how to move again, and that requires unlearning a lot of things. And that's kind of what this intro is about, too, is trying to let go of those patterns we've trained us to focus on. If you go to my channel, Greater Exodus Vitality Restoration, I have now over 100 videos on posture. I mean, that's all I do. That's my thing. So the decompression stance is at the core of everything I want to teach. And why it's called mastering out of the hip hinge is I'm teaching you how to have a strong, stable foundation. So there's a few things that I feel that, you know, when we bring comforts into our lives, it brings curses, it brings weaknesses. One of the few examples would be flat surfaces and shoes. And of course, sitting, but everyone talks about sitting. And yes, that shortens the hamstrings, it changes the way we walk, and that's another thing that's a factor here, or tech neck and using technology, phones in the car, and sitting in the car, all that stuff. But let's focus on flat surfaces and shoes. So shoes, most shoes have a heel when you're walking. Um, you're not using your deep iliopsoas hip flexor to control and guide your strike. So that leads to a weakness. We don't need to use that muscle anymore because we have this rubber absorbing the shock. Next, flat surfaces, we don't need to grip and grab the ground, activating our three arches. And that's the, the first few videos are talking about the hips and talking about the three points of contact, creating the three strong arches in the foot, the transverse, the medial, and the lateral arches, all activating at once to grab with every step. And you can even do that with your shoes. A lot of people are like, all right, they've already thrown out what I said. They're thinking, I'm gonna go barefoot. Uh, no, no, I mean, there's minimalist type of shoes that I think can help with that idea. Um, but uh, you don't wanna be going out and bruising your heels because we have to retrain yourself how to walk first. It's not so much the shoe at this stage of the game. We gotta, we gotta work backwards, we gotta work back slowly. It's baby steps, literally steps. And we're gonna, we're gonna break that down more. That's just an example of what's happening in our first world culture with these comforts that we've created that are creating weaknesses. And uh, 
And the big thing is you can have washboard, abs, you can be really built, built and strong and still have the same degenerative processes as someone who has a desk job and is overweight and hasn't been to the gym in three years. Because we're seeing the same types of degeneration. I'm seeing the same patterns of atrophy in people's spines. And that's what's great about my job as a chiropractor is this is not just me looking at textbooks. Every person I'm looking at is a case study. I'm looking at their posture. I'm feeling their muscles. I'm feeling their spines and the muscles that I'm most concerned about in this this video playlist is the transversospinalis muscles. These are the posterior chain muscles, those deeper spinal muscles that sit in between the spinous process and the transverse process. And again, we're going to go over that and why those are so important. But essentially, we're making the link here to atrophy or degeneration in the spine of course going to lead to neurological complications. There's neurological stress, I like to call it. Um, and then we could essentially link poor posture to any condition, any disease we have today. Some more directly linked. Um, and we can connect those dots as you will. Um, let's talk about the gut, you know, just as an example. Why, would, why do we have so many gut issues in our culture? There's even mechanical issues with all like people talking about flat footing squats and how we eliminate and how all the problems there with just mechanical, the inability to hinge at the hips and that mechanical release of the bowels. Well, there's also neurological complications such as what I call being locked in the sympathetic state. I talk about this more in the breathing video, but uh, the sympathetic state is your fight or flight. And one thing that goes out the window when you're in constant fight or flight is digestion, your immune system. So we call the enteric nervous system, it is your gut. You know, it's like you said, you said, your gut feeling, that's your gut brain. So we do have a lot of central nervous system outside there. We have the enteric nervous system in control of a lot of what's happening there. And even with the spine, more mechanical, you can think of the chronic tension up top in the suboccipital region. We have the vagus nerve, which is a strong parasympathetic to the gut. Vagus means water, it goes to a lot of places. But one of the things it does help out with is the gut. So there's just an example there. And there's many lines, there's many dots we connect to the gut there. So it's just one singular thing we're running up. There's many connections to the spine. There's many connections to our biomechanics that would affect the gut. And this is an example. We can talk about the kidneys, we can talk about the heart, we can talk about it. And most people are here because of pain. They want to get out of pain. And in the process of getting out of pain, this is one of the best things you could do for your body. I strongly believe that there's so many people who are just like going to the gym all the time and really pushing themselves and they're eating these super healthy diets and they don't understand why they still have all these pain and why they, all these autoimmune diseases are starting to arise in their bodies and why they're breaking down still. <laughs> I'm in shape, I'm super thin, I'm eating kale, I'm taking all these expensive supplements and all these essential oils, I'm going to the chiropractor, I'm doing all these things, and I'm still in pain. I'm still having these diseases show up. Why, why do I have to live like this? Like I'm walking on glass all the time. Um, we're more durable than that, people. I believe it strongly. Um, but we're only as strong as our spines are. If your spine is weak, it's like you're babying it all the time. And I remember before I got into this stuff, I would set myself up perfectly on my bed at night. Cause if I didn't, I'd wake up from terrible pain. I, I had little foam wedges that I created and I would just support all my tight areas and support my spine. Like I was sleeping in a coffin. And I just did that for a while. Like that's how I did. And then it's like, I got to the point, like, why am I doing this? Um, it's like when you were a child, you didn't have to sleep like this. But now, you know, you go on a, a roller coaster and your neck is sprained after you're done. And when you were a kid, that you didn't have that problem. There was stability. So it started me thinking about stability. And I just didn't wake up one day and be like, what if I had better posture? And I was already trying. I thought I was having good posture. I had to reteach myself how to move correctly. And it started from the ground up. And that's the big mistake here, is most of us start from the top. We think, well, I gotta get the head over the shoulders. I gotta, the, the big rounding is what scares everybody. And when, usually when I talk about posture, even before I even start talking about the feet, 
they're already doing this weird posture extension issue. I'm just seeing it in everyone's faces as they're, they're leaning back. And that's going to add compression to our spine. It's going to add neurological tension. It's going to make things worse. Because then you're mainly playing to the big erector spining muscles. The things that keep you out of the old man posture, you notice those are what are atrophy when people go into that antalgic rounding later in life. Your, your spine is a great compensator. It's good. It's got lots of motion. It's got tons of joints, discs, and facet joints. It's good at dancing and moving around. And, and really, most of the time, a lot of people don't have spine pain. It's elsewhere. It's foot pain. It's shoulder pain. It's elbow pain. It's knee pain. It's hip pain. Um, the spine's good at taking it because it can move a lot more compensate a lot more than other joints like like the knee it's knee and it doesn't have a lot of play right it does one thing and you know flex and extends um, doesn't have much you know abduction adduction going for it uh, whereas the spine it can twist it can turn it can you know it, it's good at that and, and we should encourage that but I think we just do that too much we rely on the motion of the spine and we never teach it to act strong as a stabilizing structure. And I think that's even developing now in children very early age because they never learn to use their feet. They never learn to use their hips and the spine is already in a state of compression really early on in their lives. So they're coming into the chiropractor, eight years old, feeling like an 80 year old back to me. I don't understand it. And it's getting worse and worse and worse as our culture gets more and more comforts, more technology. We make it easier on our bodies. I mean, that's the thing, it doesn't make any sense. We make it easier on ourselves, which makes us weaker, which makes us die quicker. Our quality of life is out the window. We're on drugs all the time. So we got to stop this process. And that's why I'm so passionate about this. Hope this made sense. I know this is all quick and I don't want to get down and dirty about all this stuff, but. Uh, I really hope you watch this video series. Uh, give me comments. Um, I want to make them better. I want to, you know, I'm not a video editor. I'm a, I'm a chiropractor. <laughs> Just doing my best here with, with the audio and, and with the pictures and the anatomy. And I know I, I, know I talk over people's heads sometimes. Um, so if you want me to get something more in layman's terms, I can, I can help you out with that. Um, cause my, my passion is to is practitioners, and I like to teach at colleges to massage therapists who are who are learning about this stuff. Who you know they already know some of the anatomy, and that's that's easier for them to put the pieces together. Sometimes it's harder because they're so you know they're so trained to think about postural syndromes, like upper cross, lower cross syndrome, pelvic tilts, anterior pelvic tilts, and even patients are getting into this stuff. They're studying this stuff too, and and they're putting the cart before the heart, the horse. They're trying to, to fix pelvic tilt, and a lot of times you'll you'll you get the symptom you'll get the symptoms to go away as long as you're doing the exercise. But they'll come back, or you'll create and you're just robbing Peter to pay Paul, and you're creating symptoms in another area. You're like, oh yeah, if I, I fixed those hip thing, but now I got this pain in my neck, or just whatever have you, depending on what they're trying to fix. A lot of people are like those. So you know, if, uh, if we have anterior pelvic tilt. I don't go into this stuff because I don't like to confuse people. That's why I'm trying to keep it simple with these steps. Like anterior pelvic tilt, you're going to have hyperlordotic curve. Too much curvature in the lumbar spine. Um, and what they'll do is instead of really fixing the pelvic tilt, which is more about the hips, they'll recurve the spine the other direction. They'll, essentially, they'll flatten it out, bring it into a posterior tucking position, which is a lot of people's problems as well. And a lot of people don't even know. They, they, they look at themselves and they think they're anterior pelvic tilt. They're really posterior pelvic tilt. They're doing all these exercises. They're getting worse, 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 worse. Especially with the hip flexor, everyone thinks they're the anterior pelvic tilt. They're always stretching their hip flexor, and I tell you right now, I just believe everyone's hip flexor, their iliopsoas, is weak. It feels tight to you because it's taut, it's overstretched, but it's weak. It's weak because of the shoes, and this is universally across the board. Unless you're like just climbing mountains all the time and sprinting barefoot, um, but and it's usually the spine is weak hip flexors are weak and your feet are weak and we have to address those things the central structure the foundation before we and then and then if you still got some issues then we can look at okay we've corrected the spine that's never happened where someone's coming in and I feel perfect tone in their spine it's yet to happen we get to see it there's usually large blocks of atri atrophy in the spine those you know, posterior chain muscles or sporadic blotches of atrophy and yeah, no one's gonna be perfect. But even 
it's getting somewhat there unless your pain disappears immediately, just like happened in my life where I was ready to quit chiropractic. I was in pain all the time. Um, I have just figured I'd be in a wheelchair. By the time I was 40, I, would be, I figured I'd be lucky if I made it to 40. I'm 31 now. I know I look like I'm 12. Sorry. See, your posture keeps you young, guys. Um, but yeah, we, we need to get that right. And then you can think about, okay, and it'll even add it to the decompression stance. It's like, okay, you have a little too much anterior pelvic tilt. So after you do your decompression stance, you add posterior tilt after. A lot of people, they're adding it first, and that's re patterning the spine. It's stealing motion from the spine to help you get more range of motion in your hips. And a lot of people, like they do yoga and they think I have great balance and I can get so deep into these exercises. Um, but what is moving? Are we motioning the hips and shoulders or are we stealing, robbing motion from the spine or the sacroiliac joints? And that's the big question. But as long as you strengthen the spine, it's going to transfer into anything we're doing, like yoga or your, your deadlifting even. It's gonna make all your movements stronger. They're gonna be harder for you. They're gonna be more intentional, but it can be so much more beneficial.